Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Achilles, for the nice introduction. Uh, welcome to the first panel conversation of what promises to be a very um, stimulating and interesting day. Uh, as he, Achilles said, we're going to talk about the Athens effect, the growing sense, uh, both nationally and internationally, that Athens, with its great gallery scenes, its diverse population, its important museums and private collections, private foundations, is becoming a real center for contemporary art. But I also want to talk about, I hope, we, I hope the panelists will talk about some of the challenges that a city um, so strongly identified with classical culture and antiquities has to face in trying to, um, in trying to create a, a different kind of identity for itself. Um, so let me introduce my ridiculously over-accomplished panel. We're very uh, honored to have the mayor of Athens, Kostas Bakoyanis, uh, Katerina Gregos, the artistic director of the National Museum of Contemporary Art, known here as EMST, and Aphrodite Panagiotaku, who's the director of culture at the Onassis Foundation. Um, when I wrote, uh, as Achilles said, I wrote a piece about uh, th this very topic uh, at the start of the year. Um, Katerina used a great phrase that everyone has constantly used since, um, Achilles referenced it yesterday, my editors used it as a headline, and so I want to start with that. Uh, she said, we're living under the shadow of the Acropolis. She was alluding to the historically dominant focus on classical culture in Greece. And so, Katerina, I want to ask you um, if you can talk a little uh, from your perspective um, in, a, in a public museum, how much is contemporary art still struggling to get out from under that shadow? Um, well, oh, sorry, you need to, okay, I'm gonna switch off. Um, Thank you, Rosalind, and thank you, Achilles, uh, uh, for inviting me, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, well, that's the, the, the long-standing question, is when you have a, a country that has such a tremendous heritage, which you actually need to safeguard, um, that poses a lot of challenges and problems. And our history also is not a history of, of modernity. We didn't experience modernism to the same degree that other countries uh, did. Um, and so indeed, uh, contemporary art is a relatively new phenomenon. And until now, I would say um, it has been under the shadow of the classical heritage. But I think in recent years, people have come to understand that you know contemporary art and, and, and uh, classical heritage are not mutually exclusive. Um, they're both there and they both need to be safeguarded and, and supported. Um, I think it's really important, however, to understand that our, our current identity is not based on our past identity, which I think has been the case until recently. Um, we need to develop our current identity through contemporary culture it's in all its forms. And this is something that's happening very recently, um, both in the public and the private sector. Um, I think people have understood across the board that contemporary culture is living culture, classical culture is something else. And um, Athens is a very young city with a lot of creative practitioners, people who've lived in the diaspora, who've come back after the crisis, people who stayed during the crisis and self-organized in very difficult circumstances. And I think that's what's given the city its new energy, partly. There are other things as well. Aphrodite, you, when we talked um, for the article, you talked very um, persuasively about how the Onassis Foundation, in fact, had been instrumental in carving out an identity for contemporary art in the city. And I mean, you're not bound by the sort of funding issues that, that the national museums are. Um, can you talk a little bit about this? What's, what, how do you see your role in, in, in creating a sort of um, identity for contemporary, an Athens identity for contemporary mm -hmm. art? Well, as Achilles uh, said, and we definitely take that as a compliment, we are the disruptors, or at least this is what we try to be. And um, by that, we mean that it's not about the funding in our case. It's about the fact that not having to take any money from the Greek taxpayer gives you the responsibility and the right to take risks. Uh, and this is how disruption comes in. So in that sense, um, private money, that the foundation makes it by itself is a weapon for freedom and it's a weapon for mistakes. Uh, because if you don't have uh, this kind of luxury to make mistakes, then you don't take risks really. But apart from that, I would say that um, it's interesting that we're talking about the difference between um, the ancient heritage and contemporary. Well, at some point, as somebody else said, the Acropolis 
and the Parthenon were contemporary. And um, people were not crazy about it either. And we've seen that there were complaints about private sponsors back then at the time, and there are still complaints about private sponsors nowadays. Uh, well, as on us foundation, uh, we collaborated with the state uh, in order to create the paths for uh, handicapped people and people with kinetic problems up on the Parthenon. And we also uh, put this new elevator for people go to go up, and still that had a lot of opposition, and not to touch the rock, not to do all that. So in the case of Athens and Greece, whatever is hold is holy. And if you step on it, if you touch it, uh, it's like going against um, the value of a religion. Well, I think that contemporary culture is all about not being religious. It's all about reflecting what's happening right now. It's this contempo. And uh, in that sense, I think that Athens gives you the right not to be in a theme park where you have the ancient culture and another theme park where you have the galleries or um, the studio, art, the artist studio in deprived areas or something like that. You can have everything together. So if you go to Keramikos, for instance, you have the most ancient cemetery, and of course you have some very interesting galleries and you have um, artist studio. So I think that the crisis put Greece on the map for all the bad reasons, but it helped the world forget about the Parthenon for a while. It made people focus on Greece as a place where catastrophe is happening, the contemporary Greek tragedy is taking place, and that actually gave us the right to change the agenda. And we started talking about what is happening in Athens in spite, despite, or because of the crisis. And I think right now um, the big issue is how can we keep ourselves relevant? How can we keep um, the international scene interested in Athens now that the crisis in no, is not here in the same way? Uh, because there's this kind of um, notion that where there's crisis, you have interesting art, and this is where you go in order to see what's new these days. So how can we make people come to Athens uh, not just ask here, and be interested in what is interesting uh, without being on the news. Well, let me um, ask uh, the mayor about that. Uh, you know, from your perspective, I imagine that um, the importance of the classical uh, heritage is, is enormous in terms of tourism value. How do you think about the role of contemporary art um, as part of Athens' identity? Well, good morning. I would like to begin by also paying tribute to Marina Labrakiplaka, the last uh, grand dame of uh, Greek culture. She will be missed. And of course, I would like to thank uh, Hilas Tsialtas and his amazing team for bringing us all together. This is a true celebration. And I must uh, confess that as mayor, I am particularly proud. So ladies and gentlemen, I think we can be honest with ourselves and I think that we can admit to ourselves the following. This is the moment of Athens. This is the moment of Athens. Much like it was the moment of Lisbon 10 years ago, the moment of Berlin 20 years ago, or the moment of Barcelona 30 years ago. Yes, we have been through uh, a very long and tough time, I mean, multiple crises, but we're not just bouncing back, we are bouncing forward with a newly found sense of self-confidence and dynamism. And of course, oftentimes the question is raised how we can come to terms with our admittedly glorious past and our admittedly majestic ancient heritage. To that I'd respond that it's not an either or question, but it's about both. It's about being equally proud of our past, as we are of our present. Athens is a metropolis, is a gate uh, to globalization. Athens is the home of vibrant uh, communities that rage against the night and dream of new dawns. Some of the best representatives of these communities are on this panel this morning and it's a privilege for me to join them. So practically, 
if we want to take the next step, what is the role of the city of Athens? The role of the city of Athens at the time of networks rather than hierarchies is to be an open source platform. We want to make sure that all the voices are heard. We want to make sure that all flowers, to use the old communist saying, bloom. We want to make sure that no one tries, or even if they try, that no one succeeds in imposing their aesthetic um, approach or their Weltanschauung or their identity on anyone else. Because at the end of the day, it's about building a city that's fair and inclusive. And you can see this right now when you walk around Athens. You can see how, Achilles mentioned a few examples earlier, you can see how the cultural scene is transforming Athens as we speak. And this, and I'd like to end by directly responding to your question, is key for tourism as well. The last thing we want for Athens is for us, as Aphrodite said, to become a tourist, uh, ancient Greek or neoclassical uh, Disneyland. We want to change without losing our soul. And yes, it is about mixed land use. The fact that you have the most impressive ancient ruins next to a Byzantine church, next to a mosque, next to a Michelin a Michelin restaurant next to uh, an amazing gallery that could be in New York or London or Paris, next to a shop that quite uh, literally sells spices. That is the beauty of Athens, and that's what we have to safeguard for the future. Um, you know, that is a very uh, inspiring and um, wonderful vision of Athens, but the realities, uh, I imagine, for, uh, for people in the public sector, I'm looking at you, Katerina, is that there's a, uh, a finite pot of money and that it has to be divided. And, um, you know, when I did this piece, sorry to keep alluding to it, but that's my background on it, everyone I spoke to talked to me in a slightly off-the-record way about the rift between uh, what was described as the archaeologists, the people who are in, in, invested in and occupied by classical heritage and people in the contemporary sector, and that there was this sort of division and, and it, perhaps not particularly um, warm feeling between, between them. Um, and so, you know, there are very real practicalities to take into account. As wonderful as the vision you portray of Athens there is, I wonder uh, how easy that is to achieve um, Katerina, could you...? Well, um, I think one thing we have to be very wary of is the hype. Beware of the hype, as someone said. I mean, it is true, Athens is a wonderful, dynamic city. It's much more cosmopolitan and multilingual than it was before. Um, it's become a city destination in its own right. However, um, we've all heard the talk about it being the new Berlin. It's not the new Berlin. It can't be compared to Berlin. We have nowhere near the same amount of institutions, nowhere near the same amount of galleries, nowhere near the same amount of artists. Um, we are living through a moment. I'm very wary even of the word effect uh, because that implies a short term um, a period. I think the, 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 the ultimate question for all of us who are here today and people who care about culture is sustainability sustainability and longevity. Because yes, it is our moment, I totally agree with the mayor, but the question is how do you sustain this in a world where everything is you know, based on sound bites, where everything is consumable, where the art world is a traveling circus that moves from one place to the other. And that actually requires a concerted effort on the part of many, many actors, both private and public. And indeed, money is one of the things. It's not the only thing. The other thing is, of course, ideas. How do you stand out in this kind of globalized art world where everyone is copying everything else, everyone is trying to check the right boxes? You need to do that by understanding where you are, what you represent, and what you have to propose. 
Um, and I think this is where Athens has an advantage. Our geopolitical location in Southeast Europe, we're neighboring the Balkans, um, North Africa, Middle East, we're in the Mediterranean, cradle and crossroads of civilization. Um, that is an incredible narrative um, tapisserie that you can build on. Um, so, actually what you do have to privilege is, of course, not only marketing and everything else, what you actually have to privilege is artists and cultural practitioners. And the, the million dollar question is, of course, Athens became sexy because of the crisis. You know, one writer called it pornography, not pornography. Um, and indeed, you know, poor and, and downtrodden and, and, you know, disenfranchised places are very sexy places for artists. But then comes gentrification, et cetera, et cetera, and there's a whole cycle of events that follows. So to me, um, I'm saying this so that people in the, in the public sector, but also the private sector, if you do not create an ecosystem, a sustainable ecosystem, where people can actually make a living, where artists are paid, where people who are coming from abroad, um, you know, partaking in all of this enthusiasm about Athens, and it's true, we have a wonderful lifestyle, it's a young city, there's nightlife, there's offerings, I mean, there's nothing, you know, we certainly don't feel like a second-class uh, city in comparison to other major European cities. Um, however, the reality of the matter is that if you ask most artists who come here, they really, really struggle to make a living. Um, you know, we are in a city where most institutions until very recently did not pay artists fees. Um, it's very difficult to make a living as a dancer, as a theatre director, as an actor, as an artist. Um, the art market is very small. Now, these are all extremely important actors that need to come together. The public sector needs to come together in order to sustain this very fortunate moment that we're having today. Um, and if you don't create a, a viable, sustainable system, then this effect is going to wear out. And I, I say this to everyone and to ears left and right, that we all need to work together to make sure that this lasts that we can actually create reasons for people to come and not only live here and enjoy the nice weather and the islands, but actually be able to make a living here. Aphrodite, can you speak to this from your perspective? Well, uh, I am so happy to hear Katarina saying all that. It's exactly the words that I use all the time. Um, and yes, I don't believe in the Athens effect, to be honest, at all. And I think this is where the Onas Foundation uh, comes in, because what we try to do is actually not support, but work with um, people with creative minds, curious people, in order to be able to live in Athens. So I would say that if there is one thing uh, that we have to take care of as a country, and I'm looking at the mayor, because it really scares me thinking of a Michelin star restaurant next to Spices, uh, because the guy who owns the shop for selling the spices will not be able to support the rent if there's another Michelin star restaurant right next to him, and if there is a loft uh, you know, taking, being renovated upstairs. <clears throat> so that really, really scares me. So in that sense, I would say that real estate is the key in order to have an interesting city. And if we have something that is definitely good for us right this moment, it's exactly that, that people can still afford live in the center of the city. Because if you're an artist, you don't live in the suburbs. And you're, if you're a contemporary artist, you definitely need to be in the center of the city. So I think that one of the big challenges is to make sure that real estate actually stays where it is at least Otherwise, people will just be going to a cheaper city. So um, at Onassis, for instance, what we try to do, and this is why we keep on talking about the process rather than the product, and the people <clears throat> rather than the productions, is that we have to understand that artists are not people who just um, make their passion a reality. The, uh, this is a profession, this is their job. So we cannot expect people just to hang around, come up with great ideas, and then create something magnificent. And I'm not talking about the cost of the brush, I'm talking about the cost of living. So I think this is where the private and the public sector have to come together in order to understand that, no, you're not paying as a state a person to sit back home and think, and that means nothing. No, you have to pay a person to sit at home and think, because that person will write a book, and some other person will go and, and practice properly in order to be a dancer and not a waiter in a bar at night. So I'm very proud, 
for what we do, and I'm looking at the president, because for instance, right now there are 10,000 um, people who are on us as scholars and fellows. And it's interesting because when we run our residencies, and when we started one of our recent programs, we said we're going to create this program where you don't have to produce anything. It's called Onassis Air, Artists in Residence. You just come, you work together, you have to be together every day. We're going to give you the money, a specific amount, but you have to go out there and find yourself a flat in order to communicate with the community, in order to understand where you are. You don't have to create anything, you don't have to produce anything, you don't have to leave anything behind. And in the beginning, that sounded like, wow, that's fantastic. And then artists realized that this was the most difficult thing. And of course they produced. Mm. And of course they had to think more. But if we're talking about Athens as an interesting city, I think we have to think of the people who make a city interesting instead of the tourists. We have to think of the neighborhoods first and then of who is landing at uh, our airport and then move on. If we are interesting for ourselves and the community that lives in Athens, then we will be interesting for the rest of the world. And geographically speaking, I'm definitely more interested in uh, Maghreb or the Balkans than I am I, in Paris. I, I want to come back to that because it's such an interesting point, but I want to ask the mayor, um, I'm very interested in your comment about real estate um, and the, import, the importance, one doesn't think about that so much, but that is of course so important in keeping a, um, a vibrant artistic community alive in a city. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, um, first of all, I'm very, very happy we landed in the material world, where I feel much more comfortable, since my main job is to pick up the trash. So uh, let me begin by saying the following, and I would like to be very, very frank. I find porography offensive. I want to repeat that. I find it offensive. I find it offensive for the city of Athens, and I find it offensive for the Athenians. And I find the the vision of Athens that is uh, you know, shaped through the eyes of people who land from New York or Paris and London for a few hours disturbing and distorted. Much like I find the vision of Athens that is shaped through populist or elitist eyes equally distorted and equally dark. I'm reminded of, you know, of Manos Hadidakis, a great Greek composer who used to say that the biggest enemies of politics and of democracy are populism and elitism. Yes, they are. And they're also the biggest enemies of culture and arts, if we want to be very frank and very transparent. So yes, I fully agree that it's about the quality of life of Athenians themselves. If the quality of life of Athenians improves, the experience of tourists, visitors, residents, scholars will improve as well. And of course, this is our priority over the last 30 months, where we have been reinventing, literally reinventing our city services after a tough decade, and where we are actually moving forward with the biggest uh, investment program, public investment program in the history of the city, uh, bigger even than that, that preceded the Olympic Games. But we have to have our end goal in mind. I will continue to support mixed land use. And I'll be happy to walk around Athens with whoever is interested in witnessing not the Athens effect, but the effect of the Athenians. And see how all this, you said the word tapisserie, I find it wonderful. This tapisserie, this living tapisserie, and engage with this living tapestry, not from you know, a glass tower or an ivory tower, but there, bottom up, rather than top down. And one more thing about real estate. If you, one looks at the whole of Athens, one will see that there is no gentrification right now in our city, none whatsoever. There are certain areas, namely, I don't know, Kolonaki or, I don't know, Mets or, Pagrati that have seen prices rise, but at the same time, there are so many neighborhoods, and yes, Athens has 129 neighborhoods, where prices still remain very low. So there are many, many opportunities right now in Athens. And of course, we hope and we strive for our city to gain value, because when our city gains value, the Athenians themselves uh, gain from the evolution and the development and the growth of their city.
But then you have the um, you have the sort of intractable problem that it's good for people if their property becomes valuable, but it's much harder for artists, people who don't have a lot of means to to, to live here. And so I'm wondering whether you have, whether the city has, whether the state has, um, you know, any thoughts about how to keep a vibrant, uh, let's say, less affluent community going in Athens. Is that something that you, is that something that well, has um, been... I know that, I know that uh, the Onassis Foundation is doing excellent work. I know that the Ministry of Culture um, is also working with, with that. Nicolas Yatomanalakis, who is the Deputy Minister responsible, has done some great work on that as well. Um, what I would like to say, however, is that right now we don't have the phenomenon of anyone being priced out in Athens. If you walk, for example, around Kipseli, around Fukionos Negri, which has attracted so many uh, artists from all around the world over the past few years, you will see that it, it's, it has kept its, its multicultural uh, character and it remains open to so many different artists. Let's go back to um, Katerina's point about the Balkans, because one of the things I wanted to ask was, you know, people talk about the Bilbao effect and there have been a, a, a lot of... Um, a, a lot of attempts to replicate that all over the world and um, sometimes I think what you end up with is a rather sort of homogenous big uh, fancy new architectural statement museum that people do come to um, but which is perhaps not um, completely representative of a, of a kind of local culture or, so, or a specific um, national culture and so I wanted to in fact ask um, uh, what you think about this and whether uh, there's a, a role for uh, a way for Greece to create its own identity that is not necessarily based on a kind of Western Europe model, uh, a, Tate, a Tate model, let's say. Well, that's an excellent question. Um, I can only say that those days are over, thankfully. You know, the days where people invested in just buildings and didn't actually consider what was going on in them um, and didn't also consider questions of sustainability um, are definitely over. I mean, this kind of glam effect, the star architect, it is so over. Um, and I think people who are trying to do this nowadays have definitely missed out on a large, large discussion, both about architecture and inclusion. Um, I can only speak um, um, from my point of view as artistic director of the National Museum because when I was appointed um, a year ago, um, the first thing, the first question I asked myself is what kind of a museum do we want to be? Um, what do we want to represent in this massive ecosystems of, uh, ecosystem of museums? And one thing that was perfectly clear in my mind is that I didn't want to imitate any of the large global brands. I didn't want to imitate Tate or, or, or MoMA or the Guggenheim um, because in my experience of living over 20 years abroad, um, what's happening and it's rather sad nowadays and of course, you know, networking and social media and everything have a lot to do with it because everyone is interconnected. But basically you go to one city and then you see an exhibition, then you see the same exhibition in another city in another museum and everyone sort of copying each other and trying to check all the right boxes, um, you know, be politically correct and, and, and of course justifiably inclusive and all of that. And you think, hang on a second here, this is really not very interesting. So the first thing I actually thought about is where am I? You know, where are we? We're in Athens. Um, Athens is a metropolis of southeastern Europe. Um, it's an incredibly interesting fabric, of, as both of you have said. And the advantage is that we have a very rich history, not only in terms of classical antiquity, but our, our history of the last 200 years, you know, the legacy of the Ottoman Empire, which we've repressed as a bad chapter, you know, the Turks are bad. But we've never actually thought, hey, hang on a second, how come we still speak our language? How come, you know, we kept our religion? That is because it was, to a relative deg degree, tolerant. Now, all of these you know, all of this intermingling of cultures, religions, you know, you have to remember Thessaloniki was not a Greek city, it was Jewish, it was Armenian. There's a history, there's a, there's a, there's a history of what the so-called Levant, which we in Greece have somehow marginalized because we've always been very westward looking. You know, it has to do also with the establishment of the modern uh, Greek nation state, which was modeled on, on a German idea of classical antiquity. But now is, is the reckoning moment. You know, who are we? Let's hold up the mirror. And we are both East and both West, and we're a hodgepodge. And 
we have unbelievable historical and cultural narratives that are still untold. And this is my mission at the National Museum of Contemporary Art. How do we unearth these narratives? We do want to stay international. There are two things that you can do to stay relevant. One is define where you are and have a strong mission statement. Um, and, and also try to see what you can contribute to the dialogue that someone else hasn't done. Um, and, and of course, the second thing is, uh, uh, of course, is trying to be inclusive, really. Yesterday, I have to say, because I haven't blown my trumpet yet, but I will do now, um, we, 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 we had our grand reopening um, and the start of the new artistic program, and we had 5,000 people in the museum. I couldn't believe it. And everything was for free. Drinks were for free, entrance was for free. We had, you know, ages, um, you know, people of all ages, backgrounds, genders, and that is how you do it. You do it not by being elitist and exclusive, as you said. You do it by being by being open. And um, this is, of course, our mandate. And the other thing that I want to return to is this question of sustainability. We are the first national institution um, that has announced we are going to be paying all artists and all cultural practitioners. Because as Aphrodite said before, you know, until now in Greece, if you were an artist, you were kind of considered a hobbyist. You know, and, and you were invited to participate in an exhibition and you know, people thought, well, of course, we don't need to pay you because you're getting visibility, but visibility doesn't pay the rent. So we announced that we are um, paying all artists and cultural practitioners um, who work with the museum. And this we did, it's a very conscious economic, ethical and political decision, which is also trying to send out a message to other public institutions and private institutions. I know you're very good at that. Um, so, uh, so, so this is where we have to start. We have to start by creating, you know, reckoning with our identity and its shortcomings as well, and, and, and also trying to enforce within the limits of our financial possibilities, you know, we are a small country that's just coming out of a crisis, but to try and enforce in the culture sector in some kind of way best practices. I want to go to Aphrodite and ask her something, but I also want to say that um, in a couple of minutes uh, we'll open up for questions, so if you just want to think about anything uh, you might want to ask the, the panellists. Um, Aphrodite, at the Anasis Foundation you program both Greek and international artists, and you travel, you send productions out, you create, you, you produce an enormous amount of work, you send it out into the world. How do you think about um, identity in the terms that Katerina is talking about? Do you, well, let me know. Um, <clears throat> to be honest, we don't think about identity as uh, we have to be this or we have to be that. Uh, because then it becomes something like um, an application form where people have to tick the boxes. Let's see, is it Greek enough or is it not? Is it um, relevant enough or is it not? So I would say that the point is actually to produce good work, to respect the artist, and for us to be proud of what we have produced together. So, for instance, yes, we may export, for instance, a production that is The Birds by Aristophanes, but what you see has nothing to do, of course, with um, what you would see in Epidaurus in the 80s or the 70s. So, something that in Greece people would say, you are not respecting Aristophanes and the ancient Greek heritage. Exactly. This is what we do. So, I would say that we, we try to create something that is interesting and that will make people curious about it and something that we are proud of, something that we actually like ourselves. But when it comes to traveling, one of the things that we did is that we worked on the idea of equal relationships because these are the only relationships that work. So when we send a production abroad, no, we don't pay for that. What we do is we bring artistic directors for, from other organizations, this is what we pay, the ticket, and we say that if you like it, you have to pay for that. Because otherwise, you're a sponsor, and we're not sponsors. We are supporters here, but we are not sponsors when it comes to the arts. We're either producers or co-producers. So the idea there has to do with exchange, has to do with collaboration. So even if we want to go to St. Anne's in uh, Brooklyn, then we have to convince or not, the artistic director to pay for that production. So our job and my job is actually to make sure that people understand that when they see Onassis, they shouldn't think of dollars. They should think of good 
work that will be relevant in their place. Because if something is good in Athens, it will be good, whether that is Brooklyn or Paris or Berlin or uh, Beirut or uh, Morocco. If it's not good, it's not going to be good anywhere. So I think that it's another thing that we have to think of as a country that, no, the point is not to convince somebody that, no, no, it's not just the Parthenon, we are good. If you go with this kind of attitude, you win nothing. Or if we say we have the Jonas Foundation here, we're going to pay for everything and we're going to book a, a great theatre so the Greek communities will come and the diaspora will, will come and, and just say how proud we are of being Greeks. So the idea is that, yes, it could be The Birds by Aristophanes, but the next production that uh, we want to see traveling is actually Frankenstein by Elena Kitsopoulou. And of course, it's not the Frankenstein that somebody would expect. It's a great Frankenstein, though. Um, it's a pity you missed that. But um, this is how we, how we do it. And now that uh, we have this big exhibition called Plasmata, Creatures in Pendion Tuario, so a big park right in the center of the city, uh, in the center of neighborhoods that haven't been seen as good neighborhoods lately. And of course, you had the Athenians saying, well, you, you cannot cross that park. It's full of uh, drug dealers and you know, it's a cruising area. And then you ask the Athenian, when was the last time you crossed that park? Oh, I was in law school. And that person is now 65. So you know, we, pe people have this kind of perception sometimes. And then you go there and you see everybody. I mean, just like Katerina said, yes, there are 15,000 people on a Saturday, because there's no school the next morning going to that park to see the artworks. And since uh, Katerina mentioned the openness, and I promise you, it's not that it was free. That's not it. It's because now there's the right person in charge of that museum, you, who speaks a normal language. They don't see somebody who is trying to make people think that um, we are the wise ones and we speak this language that only us understand because art and contemporary art has been hijacked in a way by people who think that it is their own right, like the opera, to own this art that has to be expensive, to understand it, which is not about understanding, it's about feeling. First you feel, then you understand, and this will make you open. The museum is there. It used to be a cemetery. And now you're talking about these 5,000 people. Us, we are in Neos Cosmos, just around the corner, in a neighborhood where, that people don't even know what it is. You know, Neos Cosmos, where is that? So we had to be there, stay there, w work with the neighborhood, and pe make people come to a neighborhood where they wouldn't come, because it's not even deprived enough. It's not full of warehouses. And now we're going to work on Patisillon Avenue, right across the National Archaeological Museum. And I'm going to be working with the universities and the Polytechnic School to create something else there. So this openness come, comes from communicating the message, being normal, as normal as the art uh, world can be, which is very far from normality, I guess, um, which makes us more interesting in that sense. And I think our job is actually to create curiosity first, and curiosity will bring the idea of trying something and then you go for pleasure. Because our job in the arts world is not to be didactic. It's about creating this weird combination of knowledge, awareness, and pleasure at the same time. And I think that if we do that as a city, because the scale really, really is great, it's big enough to be lost, it's small enough not to lose yourself. Uh, so I think that if we work together first, then we will make you come here and talk about Athens as a city where surprises happen. Surprises don't happen in Paris. Where, yes, you can walk from one place to the next and see different things, and it's a city that is changing. Because in places like Paris or Berlin, you cannot change the cities. They're too organized. So the good thing with Athens is that we are changing. Uh, we are here as agents of change. Yes, Pukayu said the same thing to me, uh, talking about the Biennale. He said the good thing about the chaos and lack of infrastructure is that anything is possible. So on that note, um, let, me, um, let me open up for questions. Uh, I think to wait for a mic. Ah. Okay. All right. Thank you for inviting me. 
My name is Della Runic, and um, I pay attention to what Katerina Grego said, that we don't lack of artists, but we are lacking for ideas. I don't think that this is true. There are many artists that have ideas, but they don't have access to where to, where to tell their ideas and to be able to find the funds. And I think all of you together, you should uh, create some kind of a small uh, institution, a window, that an artist can feel free to go and talk about his idea without having the fear that the idea will be stolen. Because if you go here to uh, art, I mean art school, the artists are scared to talk to, to one another, not to steal the idea. Then they don't have the money to start doing, creating something like that. And maybe they do have big ideas. I'm so as you are willing to give the money to them to help them, you have to find a way that they have access to you. And of course, it's a lot of time to see the mayor or to see Katerina or to see Mr. Daskalopoulos, but they have to have a window to go and talk and present the idea. Thank you. Um, may I? Yes, please. Yes, I, I, I absolutely didn't say that artists don't have ideas. That's what I, that's what I, I was going to say. I would be in the, in the wrong business. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, what I did say is, um, well, let me say that, in, in fact, in Greece, we have a situation where we have a lot of people with ideas, perhaps too many, and there is ideas flying left, right, and center. So as an institution, whether public or private, you need to be able to sift through these ideas and actually make up your mind what is interesting or not. And you need to create a platform to support these ideas, these ideas. And yes, you have to be open, but you also have to be selective. I think from, from our perspective, um, it's really important um, as an institution to have a very clear and coherent vision. Um, and as we opened seven exhibitions yesterday, to go back to your comment about um, supporting and promoting, in order to arrive at this point, we've done countless studio visits, we've met so many people, we've seen so many exhibitions, we do reach out to artists because that is our job. And at the same time, we have, for the first time in the museum's history, seven exhibitions open. They're all productions of the museum. There's over 50 artists now, um, international, Greek, um, that we've supported, we've produced work, and I think it's really important to say that, that, that we are there not only to seek out, but also to produce. And on this occasion, I'd like to warmly invite everyone in their free time to come and see the new artistic program and the flagship exhibition of the museum, which is an international um, group show with 39 artists called Statecraft and Beyond, which is looking at issues of governance, citizenship, and, and inclusion. So, um, yes, I do agree, but I didn't say that there aren't ideas. Yeah. Thanks, Katerina. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Hello. 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 I'm Alex Platon, and um, I wanted to defend the term the Athens effect and just say that I don't think Athens is competing with London, Paris, New York, or uh, Barcelona, or Berlin, but um, Athens is a place where three very loud voices here in front of us today, very competent people uh, that I'm proud of because I'm also Greek, and um, amazing institutions are here today to give us their opinion and to let us know that we're looking at the past and we're being, um, uh, we're having references from the past to look at the future. And we're very, very happy that it is happening in Athens and everybody has a vision for the Athens of tomorrow. And I think that that's the Athens effect. And also just to say something about the location of the Onassis Stegi, which is in now. Neos Cosmos, it translates into new world. So um, this is the Athens effect, and I do believe that Athens is here for tomorrow. Well, well um, thank you so much. Nice <laughs> note to end on. We have, and, and I just need to say that it's definitely art for today, and this is our job here. And the only thing I wanted to say to the mayor as well is that um, us on that panel right now, we are Athenians by choice. And I think that makes a huge difference. Uh, it's not like Katrina couldn't be anywhere else, I couldn't be anywhere else, even the mayor could be somewhere else. Uh, but he wouldn't be the mayor, probably. Um, who knows? 
unless he became a Berliner by choice. But um, yes, I, I think you're absolutely right when it comes to that, that the timing is right, that this is the moment for art uh, for today. And I think that even this discussion here uh, will be the catalyst for the discussion that will follow and we're gonna see what we're gonna be doing together, how we're gonna act in public spaces. Yes, there are amazing artists. Going back to uh, the accessibility, we run open calls and we receive thousands and thousands of uh, proposals that we have to choose from. But um, like any, everywhere else, this is a selective world. So um, even if you want to present something that you, you think that should be seen, yes, you have to be selective. Democracy uh, is not about everybody, it's about the best or the people that you think as best and somebody else thinks of somebody else as best. But definitely we cannot be doing everything uh, and I think that is now clear. Thank you very much everyone. Thank you. Thank you.